Bibles tonight, please, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 3. The Gospel of Matthew tonight, chapter number, number 3, please. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 3. And come with me to verse number 1. We're going to commence to verse number 1, please. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 3. And verse number 1 we read, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sin. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not ye, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is led unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat un into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be not so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and mating upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we know that the Lord will add His blessing to the reading from His own precious truth. It was 19th century England, and a very wealthy English baron by the name of, of Fitzgerald had only one child, and that one child was a son. Baron Fitzgerald looked upon his son understandably as the apple of his eye. He was the center of, of all his affections. And this wee lad was the focus of this little family. He meant everything to them because he was their beloved son. When this young son reached his early teenage years, the mother suddenly took ill, and from the illness it resulted with, with death. Baron Fitzgerald was left with his only son. Even though he deeply grieved over the loss of his dear wife, he devoted the rest of his life into fathering his son. As I have said at the commencement of this message tonight, Baron Fitzgerald was a very, very, very wealthy man, owned a great estate, and was a great collector of all the great artists of the day. 
He was a man who was worth, worth millions in English money. As time passed, his only son, who was now in his late teens, he himself took very ill. And it was an illness also that he would not recover from. This man, Baron Fitzgerald, not only suffered grief from the loss of his loving wife, but suffered terrible grief from the loss of his, his only son, his only beloved son, as he called him. As the years passed, life for Baron Fitzgerald was lonely. With all his riches, with all his possessions, life was just so empty without his wife and most of all without his beloved son. As the years came and went, Baron Fitzgerald himself suddenly died, and the whole estate was left. Shortly before his death, Baron Fitzgerald very carefully prepared his will with the explicit instructions as to how his estate should be settled. Because of the amount of and, uh, and quality of the artwork in his collection, because of the vastness of his great estate, a huge crowd came and gathered for this special auction. Millionaires all over England gathered. All over England had come to bid on what this man had. They inspected the paintings and they expected everything. And the auctioneer, he stood to the platform and he began the proceeding. When he hushed the crowd and the crowd fell into a silence, then the auctioneer asked the attorney to come up and to read the first part of the will. And the will read like this. The first painting to be auctioned is the painting of my beloved son. It was nothing pretty. It was a shabby enough looking painting. But when the auctioneer held up the painting and asked the people to bid, people with their big wads of money and Fat wallets showed no interest in this portrait of the beloved son. It went on for a good while, but no man would even place a bid until some wee man who knew the son well came to the front and said, says, I'll, I'll, I'll place my bid. This is all I have, he said, and he offered the auctioneer a crumpled pound note and says, I'll, I'll buy the portrait. If that's the way the auction's to work, he says, he says, I'll take the son. The auctioneer received that man's pound, and as he received the pound, the auctioneer called the attorney up to the platform again and made him read the rest of the will. The crowd was hushed. And it was quite unusual. And the attorney read the rest of the will, and this is what it read. Whoever buys the painting of my beloved son gets everything. The auction is now over. 
crowd couldn't understand what had taken place. But it was simple. And whoever would take the Son would become owners of the whole estate and everything that Baron Fitzgerald owned. It was all down to who would take the picture of his beloved son. Tonight my text for this gospel meeting doesn't come from the lips of John the Baptist. It doesn't come from the lips of the Lord Jesus himself. It comes from the lips of Almighty God. And tonight, I think we would need to listen as to what the almighty, eternal God has to say to us this evening. What has God to say to us this evening? This is what He has to say. It's found in the last verse of Matthew chapter 3. This is my beloved son. Tonight, dear unsaved friend, God wants you to focus on his only beloved son. Because I'll tell you tonight, dear unsaved friend, everything depends on his beloved son. This is my beloved son. And you know, dear friend, we need to really listen to God tonight. Do you know a great problem in our wee province? The great problem in our wee province today is this. There's a dullness in hearing to God's word. I was conducting a mission many years ago in an orange hall. It must be over 20 years ago now. And I remember there was a local man came to that mission and he was prayed for time and time again and he was prayed every night. Prayed for. And he never missed a meeting. And there was nights I preached the gospel, messages that were very difficult, even messages on hell. And he used to come out of the meeting saying to me, shaking my hand at the door, that was a lovely message, Mr. McConnell. And I said to myself, how can such a man go out of a meeting unmoved, untouched, and say to me, that was a lovely message, Mr. McConnell. Even the night I preached on the rich man in hell, oh, that was a lovely message, Mr. McConnell. It was a lovely message. But on one night, it was the second Friday night, I preached on the wee text in the middle of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And the title of the message that night was The Death, The Death of an Only Son. That night that man came out of the meeting, it wasn't, that was a lovely message tonight, Mr. McConnell. He held my hand and he just stood there. The lip trembling and tears coming down his cheeks. And he couldn't say anything. And I knew he was upset. And I said, would you like to talk to me? He says, oh, we'd love to talk to you. And I brought up up into the back store of that orange hall. So say, what can I do for you? He says, God spoke to me tonight. So say, how did he speak to you tonight? He says, through your message. So say, it wasn't my message, it was the Lord's message. I says, he says it was the death of an only son that hit me, he said. 
He says, I saw it for the first time, what God did for me. You see, Mr. McConnell, he says, I lost an only son. I know the pain of what it is to lose an only son. And he says, now I know what God did for me. That night, kneeling on a bowling mat, on a bowling mat, doesn't matter where you kneel, as long as you kneel, I had the joy of leading that man to the Lord. He's in heaven tonight. And tonight, God wants you to focus on nobody else other than his beloved Son tonight. And as we look to his only beloved Son tonight, here's the first thing God wants you to see. He was the only, his only beloved Son that was sent tonight. My beloved Son, this is my beloved Son, whom I sent. You know what 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says? Verse 9 says, rather, verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, that He would send His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. And dear unsaved friend, right, God sent His beloved Son into the world that we might live through Him, because it's through Him tonight that the sinner can live. You see, dear unsaved friend, because you and I were born into this world as sinners, we are dead tonight. We Sinners are dead in trespasses and in sin. And tonight, if you're not saved, you're dead, spiritually dead. Or you may be physically alive, but the Bible says you're spiritually dead. You're dead tonight in trespasses and in sins. And this is why God sent His only beloved Son into the world so that we may have life through Him. You know, every person in this meeting that saved it, you remember what the Bible says, God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Eternal life is not in any church. Eternal life is not in a religion. Eternal life is in God's beloved Son. You know, friend, tonight away back in Genesis chapter 3, when this world was plunged into darkness and into sin. Friend, every person born into this world was born in a hopeless state. And if you're not saved tonight, the plague of sin and the shame of sin is upon you. And tonight you're dying, and tonight you're perishing. And tonight you're without Christ. Tonight you're without hope. Tonight you're without God. And that's the way you're living. But this is the way you're dying. You're dying without Christ. You're dying without hope. You're dying without God. Ah, oh, but the message of the gospel tonight is this. In this was manifested the love of God toward us that He sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Exactly six years ago till this night, the 3rd of December, 2011, a young man took on well. It was a Saturday. I'll tell you, he wasn't a young man. He was a child of faith. Took on well. It was a Saturday. They rushed him to the hospital, and after external and internal examinations, this wee lad called Lucas Giovanni, that was his name, the parents were told that there was nothing they could do. As they stood her at his bedside, they had an awful decision to make. You can either prolong the suffering or, or decide to turn the machine off, but for this wee lad, there was no hope. The parents done a very brave thing. 
here was their wee five-year-old son. And the decision they made was this. They made the choice of donating his organ. The choice was made. And a little girl of two who was only days from death received one of his organs. And four other people, because of this wee lad of faith, lived because of what the choice that those parents made. Five people live because this wee lad died. The father said in a newspaper interview last week, we were out looking for a present for him for Christmas. Last week, this week, we're out looking for a grave. Oh, I know it's a moving story. I know illustrations and stories like this, all that touch us. But isn't it sad how often we've heard the story of how God allowed His beloved Son to die? Because He was the beloved Son that was sent. This is my beloved Son tonight. Who was sent? Ah, but there's something else God wants you to see about His Son tonight. His Son, His only beloved Son. This is my beloved Son whom I sent. This is my beloved Son who did suffer. You know something tonight, unsafe friend? You and I or nobody will ever, ever, could ever imagine tonight the suffering of of the Lord Jesus Christ. None of us will ever imagine, could ever imagine the shame, yes, maybe the shame of being stripped, maybe the shame of being nailed to a cross, but none of us could ever imagine the shame and the suffering when He bore our sins in His own body upon the tree. And listen, this is God's beloved Son we're talking about. And this is God's beloved Son who went to Calvary. This is God's beloved Son who was nailed to a cross. This is God's beloved Son who suffered on Calvary's cross. This is God's beloved Son tonight. God's beloved Son who hung there and suffered there and bled there and died there. This is God's beloved Son. Because, friend, tonight, there is no other way tonight there's no other substitute for sinners this evening apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and the moment of His crucifixion. You could never imagine the pain and the agony of God's beloved Son as He hung there. The Bible says, For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. God didn't send His beloved Son into this world to be crucified to start a religion. God sent His beloved Son into this world to be crucified, to make a payment for our sins. You know the sad thing today? You know what the sad thing is? People make the cross into a beautiful thing. People make the cross into a lovely thing. Nothing lovely about the cross. There's nothing beautiful about the cross. It's an emblem of suffering. And it's an emblem of shame. And we do not know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us that he hung and suffered there. This is my beloved son who suffered so much pain. This is my beloved son who suffered so great agony. This is my beloved son who did suffer such shame. Ah, but listen to what God says tonight. This is my beloved son who does save? Oh, he saves tonight. Do you know what John chapter 3, verse 17 says? 
God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You know, sinner friend tonight, God offers you everything that you need. God offers you everything this evening that you long for. But here's the ground rules of it tonight. You'll only get it if you take the sun. Everybody wants heaven, but they don't want the sun. Everybody wants their sins forgiven, oh, but they don't want the sun. There's no salvation tonight without the sun. There's no heaven without the sun. There's no escape from hell without the sun. And God says to me, this is my beloved son, who I have give to suffer and to bleed and to die that you might live. This is my beloved son. Oh, yes. The boys were there that day, the rich, with their wads of money and their fat wallets. Oh, their wads of money and their fat, fat wallets meant nothing to do nothing. It was all down to who would take the sun. And all the religion and all the good works and all that you can do will do nothing for you. The sinner takes it all tonight. The sinner takes it all when the sinner takes the sun. The sinner can take all that God offers them. The sinner can take all that God gives them on the grounds that sinners trust the Son. The Bible says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also, and he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You see, tonight it's all in the Son tonight. It's not in any church. God says, this is my beloved Son. What will you do with the Son tonight? All I want to finish is by saying this this evening. See, when you die, when you stand before God, God will not ask you what church you went to. God will not ask you why you were Protestant or Catholic. Not at all. The one thing God will ask you, and he'll know it already, but he'll want to hear it from your own lips, what did you do with my son? What did you do with my son that I sent to the cross for you? Because I'll tell you, that's one question you will answer. What you'll do with God's Son will determine what God will do with you two minutes after you die. Can you hear God tonight speaking to you? This is my beloved Son who died to save you. Will you trust Him? That's bound a wee word of prayer together, please. O oh God, our Father, we thank Thee for Thy love tonight. We thank Thee for Thy grace tonight. And Lord, we thank Thee most of all for Thy lovely Son, the Lord Jesus. Just pray now, Lord, if any in our meeting this evening that is without the Savior, without Thy Son, that this will be the night, Lord, when they will trust Him to be their own Lord and personal Savior. 
O God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing just the first.